Cloning can be difficult and frustrating when you go through all the steps and you end up with a construct that isn't correct and you have to do it all over again. Well, here I'm going to show you a really easy way to do cloning and how to apply it to CRISPR-Cas9 gene knockouts. It's so easy that all you're going to have to do is be able to do pipetting and then finally sequence your final construct. First, I'm going to show you just a little bit about the background of Cas9, and then we'll get into the cloning method. Gene editing can actually be quite easy. Among the best choices for gene editing are the CRISPR-Cas9 system. The Cas9 system is made up of two pieces. One is a nuclease. This is a protein that cuts DNA. Most users do not actually need to change the Cas9 too much. The other piece is a synthetic guide RNA, um, shown here. It is complementary to the, um, the genomic region that you would like to cut. This synthetic guide RNA can be changed or programmed um, by the user. So how does that look? The synthetic guide RNA has a spacer or a protospacer that consists of 20, 20 nucleotides that are upstream what is called a PAN, the, proto, the protospacer adjacent motif. For SPCAS9, the PAM is the PAM is N NGG, so the first space can be anything followed by GG, as you can see here. So, in order to do a CRISPR a CRISPR gene editing experiment, we need to pick these 20 base pairs here. And importantly, SPCAS9 cuts three bases upstream of the PAM, so it cuts where this this line is shown here. Now, there's two ways that we can do gene editing in cells. One is we can transfect with riboprotein. Another way is that we can we can put a plasmid into the organism that that expresses Cas9 and the guide RNA. This is probably the more common uh, route that people use, um, and it has advantages of being fairly cheap. If you're transfecting cells, the synthetic guide RNA and, and Cas9 can each be on a separate plasmid where you could do a co-transfection. If you're trying to make a stable transgenic plant that does editing, often the Cas9 and the, and the synthetic guide RNA will all be on one, one plasmid. So how does protospacer design actually look? Here I have map kinase 3 from Arabidopsis, and I can show you how, how I would design this. So first of all, we would target exons if we wanted to knock out a gene. CRISPR-Cas9 tends to make indels. What happens is it cuts at its, at its specific cut site, which is three base pairs in front of the protospacer adjacent motif. And most of the time when this cut happens, the organism fixes the DNA break with no, with no changes. But once in a while, through the non-homologous end joining pathway, the repair is made not perfect, where we either lose some of these bases around this cut site or we get an insertion around that cut site. That's the most common uh, mutation that happens. Once that happens, you destroy the, the, the targeting site for the CRISPR-Cas9 for that particular um, cut, and that's the end. You have a mutation. Here is a, here's the protospacer. Um, which is 20 base pairs, and here is the PAM. The PAM is NGG. It can be any base pair followed by GG. So anywhere where you have a GG in the genome, that could be a protospacer. So for example, here I see a number of places where there's a GG. So the PAM here would be CGG, meaning that 20 base pairs upstream of that um, could be another protospacer. For SPCAS9. Now, should you pick out protospacers um, manually like this by just searching for the PAM and then picking 20 base pairs? In most cases, no. Uh, it would be better if you want high efficiency to pick it out with a computer program. And I'll make another video for that. Chop Chop is a great is a great tool. So, how would we do cloning with this with these 20 base pairs? I think cloning a really difficult thing. No worries, I'm going to show you a way to do this so easy a five-year-old could do it. One popular technique here would be to do oligoannulin cloning, where we would buy two oligos that would be that would have this 20 base pair sequence, and then they would have an extra four base pairs that would allow it to to ligate into the vector. So let's see how that let's see how that would look. I'll give you two examples. Here we have a vector that has dual BBS1 sites. 
It also has the ATU6-26 promoter followed by the gRNA scaffold. And so what we need to do is we need to stick in our 20 base pairs in here. Now it couldn't be easier with BBS1. So if you if you look at BBS1, what BBS1 does is it has its recognition site here in gray, and you can see where it makes the cut. And here we have another BBS1 site in gray, and you can see where it cuts. These are type 2 restriction enzymes, so in this in this fashion, they're actually going to cut themselves out um, and leave you with the ability to put in what you want. And so as you can see here, our overhang is going to be ATTG on this side. So we're going to have our protospacer with ATTG on the 5' prime side of it. And on another oligo, we're going to have the sequence AAAC and then the reverse complement of that. So how would that look? Let's design the actual oligos for cloning here. So we take this 20 base pairs upstream of this PAM. That would be part of our oligo. You copy and paste it from your DNA editing software. You would order one oligo that is this top strand here you order one oligo that is the bottom strand, the reverse complement, with adapters on both ends. And so how they would look would be like this. Because we need the we need them to um, anneal to the cut sites left by that BBS1, we would add an ATTG onto the five prime end of the of the um, send strand oligo, and we would add an AAAC onto the five prime end of the reverse complement oligo. Once we receive these two oligos in the mail or from wherever you get them, you will anneal them to form this, um, this duplex DNA here. And cloning couldn't be easier with this. So this is, going, this is going to be a real game changer. Everybody hates cloning that doesn't work, um, but this is gonna be cloning that is basically 100% success rate. Everything, every colony that you get is, is the, um, is the right clone. And so you have the step where you have to anneal those oligos and you do that um, in a thermocycler with ligase buffer. The ligase buffer is necessary um, to allow the oligos to anneal because they it has it has the appropriate salts for that um, base pairing to happen. Then you would take those annealed oligos and you would mix them with your supercoiled DNA. Um, and then you would run it through a cycling reaction with these with these enzymes here. You could have BBS1 or you could have BSA1 or whatever type 2 restriction enzyme is in your particular vector. And you just run this thermocycling program and then you transform that into E. coli. So there's no gels, um, there's no gel purification, there's no DNA purification other than a mini prep DNA, and you get pretty much close to 100% success rate here. This is what would happen in the Golden Gate reaction for, for that vector that I was showing you. So what would happen is these two BBS1 sites, they would be cut, that piece would go out, And then your oligos would go in there and anneal, and the ligase would ligate that. And once this is ligated in here, um, you no longer have BBS1 sites. So this is a this is a terminal reaction. Um, no no more cutting can be done by B BBS1. And so this this is what makes Golden Gate cloning so efficient. I'm going to show you one more example here with a different vector. This is a uh, binary vector that can be used in dicot plants like Arabidopsis. This vector has everything on it. It has Cas9 on it, driven by the egg cell promoter, um, and it has a place for you to stick in um, um, protospacers in, into a guide RNA cassette here. Now this one is a little bit different, so this one uses BSA1 instead of BBS1, and in this case the sites are not real close to one another, as you can see here. Um, they're 1,225 base pairs apart, and you'll actually cut out a spectinomycin resistance gene in the process of doing that. But that'll move this um, ATU6-26 promoter right in front of the, um, the, the protospacer and gRNA scaffold, and then there's the terminator. So have a look at this here. Have a look at this. 
And so we have the AT6, uh, ATU6-26 promoter, and you can see here's the first PSA1 site. And notice that we have exactly the same basis here. It's always going to be that with this promoter, right? So we have ATTG. That would be um, the adapter that is needed on one end of that. Come down here. And let's see, BSA1 site here again. And what is it going to leave? Of course, it's going to leave the C. Um, it's going to need the CAAA adapter. So it's going to need exactly the same adapters as we used in the other vector, um, the PFA, PFH6 new um, that had BBS1, where you're going to have exactly these same adapters, ATTG and CAAA on on both sides therefore what you can do is you can actually take this annealed oligo and you'd be able to stick it into multiple vectors as long as they're compatible like that you'd run the exact same program uh, with your annealed oligos um, where you do this cycling from 37 degrees um, to 23 degrees 30 times uh, followed by one minute of 37 uh, five minutes at 50 degrees C. This ensures like complete cutting of any any leftover supercoiled DNA and the 80 degrees inactivates the enzyme. The only difference is you'd add BSA1 here or whatever whatever version from what company um, is, is the same enzyme. Don't worry about writing all of this down from this video. You're just going to want to come on over here to pathicar.com. Here I have uh, print protocols for this, this, and a whole bunch of other things. What I showed you here today was um, that it's really, it's, it's really easy to clone um, gene editing constructs. And if you want to, if you want to clone multiplex constructs, they don't get much harder. I have a really neat, a really neat, easy way to do that. And there's going to be another video for that. Another really important thing is that you're going to want to go see this video next if you want to learn more tricks and tips for doing lab work.